Good morning. Welcome. Thank you all for attending this important informative session today. I'm Lori Namazi, your 2021 president of Orange County Realtors, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We will be talking all things defensible space and AB 38. So I'm going to give um, you know, just another second for people to sign in. But while we're doing that, I'd like to give a big welcome and thank you for the collaboration as we are co-hosting this with the Newport Beach Association of Realtors and the Laguna Board of Realtors. And so um, I see that uh, we've got some of our friends from those associations there. And I'd like to give a shout out to Kendall Clark, who is the president of the Laguna Beach Board of Realtors, and to Brian Gibney, who is the president of the Newport Beach Association of Realtors. So thank you for being here with us today and sharing this with your members as well. We are so grateful and honored to host representatives from the Orange County Fire Authority, the Laguna Beach Fire Department, and the Newport Beach Fire Department. They will be reviewing some of the new inspection procedures for their departments um, per the ABA 38 requirements. So before I introduce our panelists today, let's take a step back and give a quick overview of AB 38, which is now in effect as of July 1st. 2021. But before we begin, as a reminder, the information provided today is meant to be given for informational purposes only and not intended to be a substitute for your broker's direction and for legal advice. If you have any questions about the topics discussed today, please first reach out to your broker and beyond that, um, your own company attorney or the CAR legal hotline. So to summarize, AB 38 did not create new laws for homeowners to maintain defensible space on their property. What it did is it expanded the requirement for a home seller or buyer to obtain documentation that the property is in compliance with the city's defensible space and vegetation management rules. So as you may recall, the fire home hardening and fire hazard severity zone disclosure requirements went into effect January 1st of this year, along with the addition um, of the form from CAR. The new part of AB 38 went into effect on July 1st, and it incorporates the defensible space disclosure and addendum, which necessitated the revised CAR form, the, which is the home hardening and defensible space advisory disclosure and addendum, that's form FHDS. And that was released in June of 2021 and also incorporates those requirements that went into effect in January. So it combines both parts of the law into a single form. So generally, this, this, this defensible space addendum comes into play when the property is located in a high or a very high fire severity zone. The property is one to four residential units or a manufactured home. Um, and the standard TDS exemptions do apply for this. So if a TDS is required, this form is required. The form gives the buyer and seller four options for handling compliance of the defensible space law, which depends on what, if any, local defensible space and vegetation management ordinances exist. So the responsibility largely becomes a contractual matter. So if a broker or agent has substantive legal questions about the ordinances or the contract for the particular property outside of the scope of the general real estate industry knowledge, it is always recommended to consult your attorney. And we're grateful that CAR and OCR has hosted several webinars reviewing the new form and information on how to determine whether a property is or is not in a high fire or very high fire hazard severity zone. And CAR also has a legal Q&A on the topics. And of course, we will post those links for your reference. So for today's webinar, we will be focusing on information about each of the fire marshal cities and what to expect should a home inspection be required. We are very fortunate to be joined by three fire marshals from several fire jurisdictions. So first, we have Kevin Bass. He is the fire marshal of the Newport Beach Fire Department. 
He has served two years as fire marshal for Newport Beach and 16 years as an assistant fire marshal for the Orange County Fire Authority. We also have Jennifer Bauer joining us today, Deputy Fire Marshal Pre-Fire Management of the Orange County Fire Authority. And she has served 30 plus years with the Orange County Fire Authority in a variety of positions. The Orange County Fire Authority provides fire services for the following cities and jurisdictions, Aliso Viejo, Buena Park, Cypress, Dana Point, Garden Grove, Irvine, Laguna Hills, Laguna Niguel, Laguna Woods, Lake Forest, La Palma, Los Alamitos, Mission Viejo, Rancho Santa Margarita, San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano, Santa Ana, Seal Beach, Stanton, Tustin, Villa Park, Westminster, Yorba Linda, and unincorporated areas of Orange County. That's almost everybody, uh, but not quite. So last but certainly not least, we welcome James Brown. He is the fire marshal for the Laguna for Laguna Beach for the last four years. And he has also served with the Huntington Beach Fire Department for eight years prior to that. So thank you all for being here with us today. We are thrilled and we are honored to have such wonderful members of our communities protecting us and leading the way. So thank you for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so as we get started here, um, I thought it would be helpful if we start with some reminders about some of the fire incidents that have happened in our county recently and for our fire marshals to explain why it is the responsibility of the entire community, not just the fire departments, to prepare the landscape and the homes throughout the county to reduce the devastation fires cause. So let's start with Kevin. Well, the city of Newport Beach is lucky. We haven't had any large wildfire disasters. However, what is now Newport Coast was on the, or would be within the perimeter of the Laguna Beach fire in 1993. Uh, over a third of the city is in a wildfire uh, district, what we call the local uh, responsibility area. So the increasing size or number of properties that are in has uh, prompted the city council and asked me to uh, start looking to more wildfire protection, more education for our homeowners. And now that we have additional issues such as uh, AB 38 uh, being ready for those inspection requests and also to look at ways to help homeowners present the best case to insurance agents as they come across those problems in terms of rising insurance costs and or even uh, dismissal or removal of the insurance policy. So we have an added responsibility, but I don't have quite the history that uh, James or uh, Jennifer has. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Education is so important. So we're glad that that's a major component of, of what you guys do. So let's go to James and then we'll ask Jennifer the same question. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I uh, changed around here with Laguna Beach Fire, and I apologize. I'm on a phone. The city lost internet access. So I'm having to do this through an iPhone. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, yeah, as uh, Kevin alluded to, we had the 93 Laguna Fire where we lost in Greater Laguna Beach about 400 homes. And what a lot of people don't know is we've had a lot of smaller fires since then, none of which resulted in uh, a, a loss of any uh, uh, any homes in the city, but we routinely have small fires uh, in various canyons, primarily in Laguna Canyon Road, just because of the, the uh, 133 going through it and the 73 as well. Um, and you don't hear about those much. We have a lot of small fires that, thank God, to date, have not resulted in any additional conflagrations, largely due to uh, weather conditions being kind to us when the small fires occur and great resources, both from our city Newport and Orange County. We've got resources from all over the area. So we do have a small fire, it gets hit fast, it gets hit hard, but they happen all the time. Uh, so obviously uh, we're, we're trying to be prepared, you know, on multiple levels, you know, for the next big one. And, and AB 38 is kind of pushing that forward a bit 
So of course we'll talk more about it as we go forward. With that, I will pass it to Lori. Oh, excuse me, to yeah. Jennifer, OCFA. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Jennifer. Good morning and thank you. Um, so for me, I have a, I, why I wholeheartedly agree with what both Kevin and James have said, just a little different perspective from me. Um, the fire service, when we are faced with wildland fires, it's a very different firefight than when you have a single structure. So when you say that it's the community's responsibility to be prepared, you're not kidding. Um, we don't have an engine that can fight a fire per household. We're often battling the front of a fire um, and trying to do structural protection as best we can without putting people in danger. That includes our firefighters. So while we'll help get animals out, we'll help with the evacuations and things, you have to kind of remember in context, we all work together. It's not just um, the community to understand how the wildfire is gonna cut in, how the embers are going to intrude, um, but the limitations of the firefighters themselves. There are some instances where you have so much fire coming at you because of the landscaping that has been planted that the hose line that the firefighter is on the end of is evaporating before it can get to the seat of the fire. So this really truly is an opportunity to reach out and educate everybody a little bit um, in what everybody's role is in this. Great. It's so important. And I think one of the things that I always feel very proud of is when we have these major fires and we do see all of the different departments teaming up together because it's it's so important for, for our entire state that we have those partnerships. And it's always such a beautiful thing to see how everyone can come together for the same for the same goal, which is to to maintain our communities and, and save lives. So thank you for all of that background. So um, we all know that as homeowners, um, homeowners are increasingly being asked to do more and more in preparation for selling their homes. And there's so much at stake and it can be very taxing to have an additional rule. What we, what we practitioners feel is just another thing that our sellers have to do. Um, so it was important to get a little bit of that background to understand why this is so beneficial. And so in the case of AB 38, um, we all know certain homeowners in high or very high fire hazard severity zones um, that are zoned residential one through four um, must have a certain amount of defensible space around the property and comply with vegetation management. So um, we'll start with James on this one. Um, is it a one size fits all set of requirements across Orange County or even the state? or do the defensible space and vegetation management guidelines vary by city or by property? Uh, yes, the answer all of the above. Hang, hang on a sec. So even within Laguna Beach, it varies. So it varies depending upon if a home was built to a fuel modification guideline requirement. If it was, it has to be maintained, the landscape has to be maintained to that guideline for the rest of the life of that home. If it wasn't, then currently we don't have another municipal ordinance. And so it has to be um, brought to state standards uh, of a, a public resource code 4291, which is embedded in that uh, uh, Assembly Bill 38. So even in our city, it, uh, it varies depending on when the home was built what standard it was built to, if it was built to a standard. Um, and then even the way we look at 4291, a public resource card 40, 4291 is probably a little different than another area might look at it. We modify uh, a state form, which is the LE100, a little bit uh, in our approach to defensible space. Um, and so, that's on our website. So if there's any realtor looking to sell in, in Laguna Beach, definitely go to the website under Defensible Space Inspections and you'll see kind of our approach to it. Uh, so with that, I will pass it off to the next fire marshal. Sorry, the host muted me. Do you, <laughs> Jennifer, would you like to speak to that next? Oops, you're muted too. There we go, okay. I wasn't sure if it was you or me, sorry. 
<laughs> um, it is not, unfortunately, universal. It is on a case by case basis. Um, while we respect the public resources code um, and the fire code, each of our cities adopts their own ordinances as well. Um, so you can imagine with 25 cities, 25 different sets of regulations, it gets a little wonky. It also has to do with when it was built. We also have information posted on our webpage, it makes it a little bit easier where you can enter the address to see if you fall into a zone or not. Um, and then we would apply whatever rules and regulations were applicable at the time of construction, as well as any state code that's come forward from that. Um, so it's a long way around the barn of saying that it's case by case. Thank you. Kevin, anything to add to that? Uh, no, uh, what we also have to add is the the length of time and the codes that evolve over time. Uh, that also is a fact. Uh, just for Newport Beach, I've got old defensible space areas in Corona Del Mar, and then I have annexed areas in Newport Coast that was using old uh, OCFA field mod standards. So with all of that in play, what we have is we have a variety of codes over time that we have to be answerable to. And, you know, someone's grandfathered here, someone has to comply differently today. It, it's all over the map. We do the best we can with the understanding that what is the end result? The end result is to provide the best protection we can so the home has an increased survivability uh, possibility in a wildfire event. Great, so what I'm hearing, and, and any of you can correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is a real estate agent is not going to be able to take one standardized rule and apply it across their business. They need to have the homeowner reach out and find out specific to their property what the requirements are. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay, and I think that's important to understand because as much as we'd like to standardize um, our role in this by having a simple answer where we will easily say something will apply or it won't, it really doesn't apply in this case because every property has unique standards, including when it was built and the, the standards to which it was built to is as I've learned from you guys um, in our pre-call and in today's um, session. So that's important to understand. So for all of our realtor members out there, this is another reason why it's so important to put that responsibility on the homeowner because agents have enough liability to begin with in the transaction. This isn't something that we should be dictating to our clients of what they're expected to do. They really are responsible for this compliance and it's their job to find out. We can be the resource of where they go to get more information. We can direct them to the proper departments and then let those homeowners find out what is required and what um, may not be required for their particular property. So great. So um, next question I have for you guys um, is, should a homeowner's property be located in a high or very high fire hazard severity zone? How can homeowners determine what dispensable uh, space or vegetation management rules apply to their property? I think we kind of covered this. You each mentioned you have um, something on your website that they can refer to. Is there anything else they should be looking, uh, any place else they should be looking for this information? Um, this is Kevin over at Newport Beach. Uh, always you go to your city or in OCFA case, you know, for all those other cities, uh, you go to the website, you go and look at the map. That's the starting point. But really, you should be talking to your fire prevention department because they will provide the extra information. Uh, we have the handout that has the low cost improvements that can be done for your home just as much as we worry about the vegetation. So these are all aspects that gender more contact with the public and their fire prevention officers. The more that we talk to them, the more they will talk to their neighbors and we can spread the, the information out. We try in a lot of other ways to get the information out, but it seems to me that personal interaction tends to have the most, uh, most results. 
Excellent. Anyone else have anything to add? James, I think you might have wanted to say something. Just, just a couple of things. First off, to back up what you had talked about earlier, it, it already is the responsibility of the homeowner to provide defensible space. And as a city, we don't necessarily do the best job of, of making them do that. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why the state stepped in with AB 38, to be perfectly honest, is that maybe some of us don't do the best job due to lack of resources and, and in some cases, an unwillingness on the part of of the residents. Um, so it's already out there, requirements already out there for the owner to provide that. A second thing is just a clarification. As a city, we are not uh, providing an inspection service in the high because we never adopted the high fire hazard severity zone. So we're only doing the very high fire. Uh, so if you go to our website, what you'll see on our map and what you'll see in our documents are about the very high fire hazard severity zone. Now that's still a huge amount of Laguna Beach. So it's not gonna make a huge difference from a realtor's perspective, but it does make a small difference. Um, so just a point of clarification, thanks. Okay, great, great. Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, to follow on with, with what James said, um, we also have, have removed the high as it's not adopted yet. Um, but for, for um, I lost my train of thought. It figures. Um, he said something about homeowners, and now it's split it away. Anyway, um, I've seen a couple of the other folks have asked for what the website is. Um, and for us, it's easy. It's ocfa.org forward slash RSG, which is ready, set, go. Um, we have similar programs and similar education. Whether you need something because it's in the high, we can give you that documentation. I know that there's some unrest, and I guess the best way to say it is we're all learning. Um, so while we are trying to explain to you the best approach at the moment, it truly is just that. It's just for today. Um, it could change next week. Um, so a lot of the questions that we're answering are going to be a little bit fluid for a little bit until we all kind of get in the groove. Thanks, Lori. That's a, that's a really important point. You know, these are today's rules that everyone in our industry and in your line of work are still trying to figure out the implementation. And so, um, you know, one of you mentioned about educating the homeowners. I think it was James about, um, you know, maybe we don't always do a good job about educating the homeowners. This is a place where I see that we can help in that effort because it's not just about home sellers that need to comply. It's homeowners need to comply. So maybe as we're out talking to homeowners, they may not be interested in selling right now, but that's okay. We can still direct them to the resources you provide so they can make sure that their home is as protected as it possibly can be, even if they're not preparing to sell. So I think everybody should take down those links to the websites um, once they're, they're posted and uh, I'm sure they'll come through with the recording as well. And just keep them handy because we can help as boots on the ground in our part of, of the community um, and get that information out there as well, just for the good of the order. And so you mentioned about the inspection. So now I wanna kind of, um, zigzag over to the inspections could kind of take um open up the curtain a little bit and have you guys give us some information about how those inspections are scheduled what happens during those inspections um what if any costs are associated with that um any information that you can provide to us because we know what a termite inspection looks like and what a a general home inspection looks like but this is new for us so uh who would like to give a little bit of information on that. Well, I guess okay. I can. We'll go, go with Kevin. Here, yeah, you're, you want me to go? Oh, James, perfect, go ahead. Okay, fair enough, uh, I, I will fire it off. So yeah, great question on that. Um, our process is uh, initially via email, even though we've a little problem uh, with our, um, our um, we have a little thing you have to fill out, fillable form being a little weird. So we can always be contacted by phone as well. And so I, I really like what Jennifer said about this being a process um, and we are all in it together. It's uh, very much a process. We're still trying to wrap our arms around it. 
some of the way it rolls out will change very will change as we roll it out um so we're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible in scheduling and you know figuring out how to make that work and be as responsive as possible as well. so for us that means we hope to get back to the person making the request you know within 24 hours that's our goal and and then schedule the inspection as quickly as possible thereafter obviously large contingent upon their schedule as well as ours um as far as what we'll look at and how long it will take it's going to vary a lot property to property uh laguna beach has got obviously a lot of um, slope uh slope properties so accessibility will be an issue in some cases uh, size of the parcel is definitely a factor how much vegetation is on is going to be a factor can we even get around um so there are a lot of factors going to be involved in in how long the inspection takes and, and what ends up coming out the other side as far as what needs to be done. Um, in some cases, it could be extremely quick, maybe half an hour, we're in and out. And others may take a few hours. Um, so wish I could give you a, more of a, a firm or a, kind of a hard answer on that, but that's the best we have coming out the gate. And over to Kevin. Um, for Newport Beach, I would say that the average inspection is about an hour. Uh, we are building our uh, process. We're building our process right now so that IT will have a map in which you can uh, click on the property and it'll tell you if you're in a high fire zone and if you need the inspection. The, uh, uh, the cost will be $219 and it is a uh, work in progress. We just started it as well. Uh, for the meantime, as this goes, you'll be calling the uh, fire marshal me uh, to ask for that inspection and I'll schedule with my inspectors. Uh, we're looking at about a two plus week rollout. Uh, considering that the uh, homeowner uh, transaction can be on the buyer side and a year's deferment, uh, we just want to let the real estate uh, team out there know that um, there is no ordinance that requires the seller to provide the information uh, as part of the close of escrow. So you do have the opportunity and the alternative to use the uh, other side of AB 38 and uh, have the buyer uh, ask for the uh, inspection rather than the seller. Great. Thank you. And how about you, Jennifer? So um, we actually had 18 inspections last week. Um, we set up our inspections on our web address. Um, you log in, you can look up the address. It'll tell you whether you um, are in or out of a zone. Um, if we've completed the inspection, the paperwork turnaround is pretty quick. We do not charge a fee for our inspections, at least not at this time. We can't do that until our board meets and we do a fee study. So um, currently they are free. Um, if we've done the inspection, we provide documentation. If we need to go out and do the inspection, the inspections are going to vary, just like James said, anywhere from 30 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on how much we need to go over. And quite frankly, what the educational interest is, you know, we'll spend as long with a, with a homeowner or a buyer as they want to learn about. Um, I think that wraps that up. Um, but for those, just a, just a shout out, um, as we go through this process and more homes are included or the new maps are adopted, expect that inspections are gonna take longer because homes have been allowed to grow and overgrow over time and not been kept in compliance, if you will, even though the rules may not be applied right now. In other words, from us, those folks that are in a zone, um, it would be a good idea for them to learn what those um, rules might be. Um, and we do do home assessments. So for those people who have never been inspected before and they would like information, they can also set up an inspection. Good, good to know. So you, so you mentioned about properties um, being overgrown. So uh, my next question was gonna be, what are the types of things you are finding when these inspections are being done. What type of um, non-compliance type items are the most common? Uh, not removing dead and dying, keeping tree limbs um, 10 feet away from the chimneys, cleaning out of the rain gutters, 
um, vegetation over vegetated within three to five feet of the home um, and just um, what we call limbing the ladder fuels. So grasses feed into bushes, feed into trees. If you keep uh, a level of separation between those, um, you wow. cause the fire to die down. Um, and we have all of that information available in handouts on our webpage. Great, good to know, good to know. And I see that there are questions coming in in the chat. We're gonna to get to those. Um, wanna get through a couple more of the questions we had prepared and then we'll get to those Q and A's um, in the chat. So um, Kevin or James, did you have anything to add to any types of um, non-compliance types items that you regularly see? Nope, Jennifer hit pretty much all the typical. Okay, okay. So a little, a little bit down here. First off, our fees are being waived in the beginning because we're rolling this out. We're not quite don't have the fee part dialed in. Just to kind of touch on that real quick, um, we do have some, uh, you know, a little different situation here in that we have some steeper slopes sometimes than other areas, and and some of them are heavily, heavily vegetated, generally with chaparral or or some other type of shrubbery. So that's another one of our bigger issues is trying to, you know, thin some of that out. And then everything else that Jennifer said, we, we have that as well. Great. That's, that's, so a lot of common, um, common items you guys are seeing across, across the county. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about properties that are in homeowners associations. How do you work with the homeowners associations? And, you know, I've been hearing a lot of questions of, of whether the responsibility falls on the association versus the homeowners. So what can you tell us about that in your respective areas? What, what are some um, general guidelines you can offer us? Um, Kevin, do you want to start? With most associations in Newport Beach, the defined areas for HOA maintenance are the lettered lots or the common areas. Um, when it becomes the individual property, then that is usually within the realm of the property owner. Now it gets a little um, different with uh, condominiums. So I would, ref I would say just check with your HOA, your property manager on where's your boundary and where's the HOA boundary. Um, the defensible space inspections that we're intending to do would be within the boundary of the property. So using the single family home as a, as a, as a norm, we would be looking at what is within the property lines and it will generally be the, uh, the responsibility of the homeowner. Um, but you can't necessarily just do whatever you want because there's HOA rules. So it's usually something you're going to work with uh, with your HOA uh, CCNRs. Great, Jennifer. Do you have any anything to add to that? Um, I agree with what Kevin said. For us, uh, we have the HOA area. If in some instances, we inspect to the HOA because they have what's called a fuel modification plan on file. Um, there may be additional things that the homeowner specifically needs to take care of in their, on their property line, in their property line, if you will, um, because we generally won't go into people's yards. We're doing the perimeter based on the fuel modification. Um, so there may be some unexpected corrections that need to take place. Okay. Great, James, anything to add? Uh, yeah, just that uh, unlike Newport and, and Orange County, we actually don't have any HOAs with approved fuel modification plans. So it, we don't necessarily have that piece of the puzzle. Um, and then just kind of going along with what they're saying, if we have a condominium uh, or, or a similar type of a multifamily, and one of them sells, we're looking at doing defensible space on the building the unit is in. So let's say we have a four unit building and unit A sells, well, they're gonna have to provide defensible space around that building. So the HOA will be involved. How? We're not exactly sure yet, um, but for us, our responsibility is to the person who comes to us seeking that inspection will provide uh, you know, either a letter of compliance if it complies or our requirements need to be done if it doesn't. And we're more than willing to work with the HOA or the individual owner 
whoever it is that's willing to work with us uh, on getting that fenceful space, uh, you know, around that building. So I'm not quite sure exactly how that's going to roll out yet. Very curious. Okay. So again, it does sound like it's a case by case basis. So while it might seem easy to say the HOA has a certain level of responsibility, it's up to that homeowner to work with the HOA to find out what that is and then still reach out to you, your respective departments to see what's required. So once again, property by property basis. Um, and it's funny because I know, you know, we we keep using that that answer. And it may or may not seem helpful to our audience, but the reality is it, it does depend on each property. And that's why there's no one size fits all. So I just want to reemphasize that again. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned about the potential for uh, future new fire maps. Can you give us a little insight into that? I, I know you may not know when, but maybe just give us a little background on how that all comes together. So CAL FIRE is actually responsible for the mapping. Um, Department of Forestry puts them out. Um, they, we call them the FRAP maps. Um, and they work very, dilig very diligently on trying to get the updates out. As you know, in the past couple of years, we've had some pretty large fires is what we're calling mega fires. Um, and when that happens, CAL FIRE, it's all hands on deck and they pull away from their normal duties as assigned. Um, the new formulation that has come up and the demands from the legislature on them to include things like lightning strikes in their formulation um, have caused some delays. Um, so I would expect that they will probably come out um, sometime mid to end of 22. Great, good to know. So stay tuned. Um, so I'm going to go through the um, questions that have been asked. I'm going to go through the ones in the Q&A first, and then I'll jump over to the ones in the chat. So um, this is for James. Does Laguna Beach have an ordinance that requires the seller to perform the inspection? Or is it similar to Newport Beach that the buyer may schedule them within the next 12 months? So we, we do not have an ordinance requiring the seller to do it. So if the buyer could certainly take it. We expect to see a lot more of that happening uh, just due to the complexity of this. And uh, so we're fine if the buyer or the seller approaches us. Okay, great. And another question for you for Laguna Beach. Um, do you see some of these AM and M approved landscape, et cetera, documents being made readily available on the Laguna Beach City's GIS system. And uh, for those of us who are not familiar with all of those acronyms, if you can help us out there and understand that. Uh, well, so what we're referring to is an alternate method of material. Sounds like we're talking about, it sounds like they're talking about a project that was built with an alternate method of material proposal that was accepted by the department. Those are always specific to a, uh, a property. They're not something that are, uh, I mean, there's certain aspects that are standard across all of them, I guess, to a degree, but they're very specific to a property, a project. And so kind of back to what we talked about earlier, if a project was built to a fuel mod guideline, whether it had an A, M, and M or not, it would need to be maintained to that approved uh, plan, that approved guideline. So they'll need to check with us and just see what it had. And then we'll just be verifying that the property is being maintained to that. That's all we'll do. Okay. Uh, Lewis, I hope that answers your question thoroughly. Um, let's see. Next, uh, this will be for Kevin. My client's house is in Crystal Cove, Newport Coast. Where? can I find out what zone the property is in? Now we've been referring agents to their natural hazard disclosure report for the zoning. Do you have any other resources you would wanna share? Well, we do have the um, fire department webpage. And when you go to the webpage, you go to the fire prevention division and that will bring up a, a, a list on the left-hand side that tells you where the maps are, the state LRA, very high hazards zone maps and such. If um, if you click the uh, the third one, which is the Newport Beach map with the Cal Fire map overlay, 
uh, that map will show that it is not, most of Crystal Cove is not within the approved map for the city of Newport Beach. Now, back in 2012, CAL FIRE allowed the cities to adopt maps with some adjustments. So there are areas in Newport Coast like Crystal Cove and Pelican Hill that are not currently identified as a very high fire. Uh, however, when the new maps come with, uh, from CAL FIRE, it's gonna capture those areas. So just to get an indicator of where it will be in the future, uh, you take a look at this map, it's gonna tell you what it's gonna look like in the future. So Crystal Cove today, maybe, maybe not. Crystal Cove in a year, definitely will be in the high fire hazard. If uh, you need specifics, you're welcome to call and we can give you a specific uh, determination for that address. Perfect. I think that's probably the safest approach is to, to call. Um, next question is, will there be priority given to sale inspections over general inspection requests? No, I can't uh, push this up to the front of the queue. General inspections are required anyways. Uh, state mandated, mandated inspections are required to be completed. Um, I only have so many inspectors available, so I can't just uh, push this ahead. I'm anticipating roughly two weeks for a call. If it gets to be shorter, well, we'll refine it as we learn our, uh, our processes and see how we can slip these inspection requests in between, um, but they will not automatically get priority. If they are doing this based on a seller, I would start as soon as you get that contract for the, uh, the sale and get that call in as soon as possible. Great, Jennifer, James, do you have anything um, you'd like to add to that response? Is it the same in your areas? I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. Um, no, a, li a little different in that, um, I'm not gonna say we're prioritizing it above other things, but we have kind of shifted duties uh, for our uh, wildland fire prevention inspector to where the, um, the Assembly Bill 38 bait requests uh, we'll get a little higher priority than just the normal educational type inspections that he does, or he's meeting a community group or going property by property. We still do that. We will continue to do that as requested by property owners. We will still come out and provide that service for free. Uh, but um, this will take a little bit of a priority over it at the direction of my chief. Um, how fast that's going to be? Well, we we always hope to get our inspections within one week. That's our goal, and we hope to do these that way. We're gonna have to see how it rolls out. Again, this is kind of a a moving target for us, so we've never done it before. Um, so we'll see how it rolls out. Great, thank you, Jennifer. How about you? So our goal is to try to meet the request within seventy two hours. Obviously, business working days. So no priority, just first come, first serve as well? First come, first serve, we, we all have the same. We all. Perfect. I don't know if I froze or she froze, but thank you. I think it was Jennifer. Okay, so thank you, Jennifer. We'll move on to the next question. Um, so what is the difference between the state CAL FIRE inspection process and the local inspection process. Is your inspection request process tied into the CAL FIRE inspection request on, looks like CAL FIRE's governmental website. Um, this is like four questions in one. Does a homeowner need to do both inspections, local and state? Maybe that would be for Jennifer. Hey, I I can answer that. They do not need to do both. Cal Fire has it posted as a courtesy and not everything that they have posted, at least when we were looking, again, we're all going through growing pains, um, was correct. So they, they only need to contact their local. Okay. James or Kevin, anything to add to that response? It, it, it's always through the local. Okay. Okay. Perfect. 
And then let's see, um, to help, com- whoops, hold on, to help complete the um, fire hardening disclosure form, which is our real estate form, um, which cities in OC have a local ordinance requiring proof of compliance with defensible space laws? Is that something we can give a generic answer to, or is that a, it depends on the property call and, and find out? Um. I can only speak for Newport Beach, and we have not adopted any kind of local ordinance um, requiring that the homeowner ask for an inspection. So uh, how about you, James? I'm not entirely sure I understand what you're speaking. Um, Lori, can you, do you understand better what they're trying to get out with that? I, th- I think what they're trying to find out is to 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 summarize, are there any um, specific cities that do have the local ordinance requiring proof of compliance? So, you know, making it a generic across the board, do we have, you know, city X, Y, and Z, and the others do not, so that they would know which property, um, which, if they had a property in a specific city, whether a local ordinance might apply or not is I think what they're trying to get to. Okay, well, this may muddy the waters anyway, so let me take a shot at it regardless. So we do have properties that were built to a fuel mod guideline that have to be maintained to that fuel mod guideline. That is requirement. That's a requirement of construction, a requirement uh, you know, of when it was built and, and it carries forward. Now, um, do we have a program right now that goes to all of those and annually inspects them? No, we do not. Um, So when we get a request, we'll have to check, see what was approved originally, you know, go through our files. And then when we come out, we'll inspect to what was approved originally, if it had an approved plan. If it didn't, then we'll just be using the LE100, which is a CAL FIRE form, modified a bit as it's reflected on our website. Okay. And Jennifer, since your um, your department covers more cities in the county than um, Kevin's is Newport and James is Laguna, do you have an answer for that? Are there any specific cities that you can share with us that do have the local ordinances or should they just contact their local fire department? I think all of the fire agencies are in the same boat. We all have vegetation management, defensible space, rules and ordinances in play. What we don't have is a rule or ordinance that says that somebody has to disclose that their property is being regulated by it. So there's a little bit of confusion in there, I think, for all of us. Um, And and there is not clarity. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's too, we're trying to simplify something that um, shouldn't be simplified and the- um, All kind of like and kind. Um, And if you're mapped, Oops. If you're mapped, it's applicable. If you're not mapped, it may or may not be applicable. <laughs> okay. So I think the best answer is contact your local fire department for the specific property. Um, okay. So we have a, a question regarding a, a property that's not in an, OA, in an HOA, but backs to an HOA. And the HOA doesn't seem to be doing a, a good job at maintaining the vegetation and will not listen to this homeowner because she's not part of their HOA. Any any suggestions for this person on what they can do? Anybody? Is that for me? Um, if it is, I can tell you. Sure. It's it for us. It's it's. I would call and and file your complaint. That's the easiest way to do it. That's how we all end up going to a location. Um, so you call the general prevention number, file your complaint, or go online and fill out your complaint. Um, and we'll put it into the queue. Okay, good to know. Um, question for James, does Emerald Bay fall under the city of Laguna's jurisdiction or Orange County's? That's Orange County. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, if, if, a res- if an inspection is done, um, how long are they typically valid, valid for? 
Um, our inspections are valid till the next inspection. However, there's some instances where there's a time period where the inspections are good for six months. So as an example, um, a property that's in our inspection program, we go and do defensible space. Uh, we'll do that, say, in uh, March. And you have a sale that's pending that's going to be in December. It's more than six months. A lot of growth could have occurred. I would say for us, six months is the best. But if you were to ask legally, our inspections go from year to year in an inspection program. Um, so in, in this instance, if anyone were to call and a property had been inspected, but it's been longer than six months, I would schedule another inspection. Okay, good to know. All right, I'm just skimming through the questions again. Um, some of them are, are specific about Laguna Beach, certain areas, um, high fire zone versus not high fire zone. I, I think you answered that one already, James. Let's see. Um, do any of you know whether um, the ability to get insurance is affected by the defensible space and or the report? Any issued report? Well, um, kind of issue. Yeah. So I, we don't know. That's the big question mark. So I get these type of questions all the time. Homeowners, I've lost my insurance or my insurance wants something. The insurance companies are, are wandering around as much as the rest of us are. They're very much trying to figure out what to do next just like fire departments are and the state is. So we're kind of all in this together. I, one of the things that my chief has made very clear and I completely understand is that when we do our inspection, it will be to either the public resource code 4291 or city ordinance properties built to fuel mod guideline. And that's it. There may be additional requirements from the insurance companies. We aren't gonna be inspecting to those. Um, we certainly respect what they want and understand that, but that's not, that's not our mandate. That's not state. We won't be doing that. Um, so I, 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 I'm curious to see how they respond to this. I don't know yet. I have been talking to them, but I have not heard a, a, a clear, cohesive response from the insurance industry on this subject. Okay. And most likely that's a company by company um, determination as well. Correct. In the same boat. Um, here, here's a good one. Um, if there is an inspection done and you do find there are items that need to be um, cleaned up, put in compliance, um, is there a reinspection? For the city of Newport Beach, if your property is within an inspection program area, yes, we will follow up. There will be a reinspection for you to comply, but those homeowners are doing that right now. The, the AB, AB 38 is asking us to inspect all properties, which means we have a lot of properties in the interior, but you're not part of the annual inspection program, which means we will inspect and we will give recommendations on what they need to do, both in terms of vegetation and where the compliance will be necessary if anyone were to ask, like your insurance company, but we are not going to be following following up on those because they're outside of the inspection program. So uh, take a property that's uh, smack dab in the middle of Newport Coast towards uh, Coast uh, Newport Coast Drive, um, that will be uh, an inspection to comply with AB 38. But if you were out on the perimeter of uh, Ridge Route and that was part of the annual inspection, we will be following up with you until it is in compliance. So you need to find out where your property is. Is it in the inspection program or not? And then we'll, we'll tell you what kind of inspection you're gonna be getting. Great, and uh, we do have one of our affiliate members who is an insurance broker, Aaron, um, who commented in the chat that insurance carriers make their own decisions on eligibility and the reports do not assist, unfortunately, so. 
as we suspected. Um, now I have two questions um, for James. Um, do you see in the future the report becoming part of the RPR request or is it a standalone? Can you uh, tell us what that is? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna RPR is the real property report for those who are zoning code nerds. That's uh, part of the Laguna Beach uh, a requirement for selling a home. Um, we do not anticipate him being part of that because remember an RPR is really a, a file search. Uh, for anybody who's done that, they know it's just the community development will go through their files, and look at everything that's been permitted or not permitted. It's not based on field inspections. Now, one thing we are hoping to work with community development on doing as part of the RPR is a check to see if there's an approved landscape plan, a design review board approved landscape. And I say that because if in fact a property has a design review board approved landscape plan, any significant changes to the landscape will have to get design review approval. Now we recently did a new zoning code amendment that allows design review approval for the purposes of fuel modification to be done administratively. That means it wouldn't be going back to the design review board. But still, if somebody's looking to sell or buy a home and it, it's heavily vegetated and we come out and say, hey, you need to trim or thin, it could be they need to get that approved landscape plan revised and reapproved. So we hope to kind of wrap this up to at least somewhat be part of the RPO. I hope that helps. Okay, good. I think so. Um, this question is for Jennifer. Um, can you confirm that from the OCFA, there are no point of sale requirements? I guess I don't even know what that means. So I don't, I'm not sure that I can. <laughs> okay, do we have any, um, so what they're, what I believe they're referring to is, do, do these reports need to have, com do the reports need to be done and then the property become in compliance prior to us transferring title to a, to a new owner? So that would be the point of sale. That's, that's okay, so that would be stated in AB 38 and, and who's doing it? Is it the seller? Is it the buyer? Who's, who are we clearing this for? Is this the one year compliance? Is what is it? So um, I don't have any control over point of sale. Okay, so so contractually then it's what the buyer and seller agree to and you your your department is not going to be involved in that, nor in the follow up if it is the buyer within the one year time frame, you are not going to be following up to make sure that anyone complied, other than any regular inspections that would be uh, necessary in your areas. That's correct. Does that makes sense. Okay. Whew, good. Okay. That's a tricky one. Uh, let's see. I think we've covered, uh, let's see, I think the only one we haven't covered is um, we have from our state association, CAR, um, one of their Q and A specifies that our purchase contract prohibits buyers from contracting, contacting Cal Fire or any government employee for the inspections. So um, I assume you guys are not aware of that. Um, who can call for an inspection, I think is really what we want to get to. Who can call and request an inspection? That's a new one for me. I don't know anyone who could be told they cannot contact a government agency. Uh, an HOA telling a homeowner they can't contact the fire department for inspection, um, I don't know how defensible that is. but. I mean, start with your HOA, but if you think your HOA is going and blocking you from your basic rights, I don't see how you can stop somebody from calling uh, your local fire department or code enforcement or uh, police department, Orange County Health Department, uh, Orange County Sewer, Sanitation. Um, I don't know how they can stop that. Uh, that, that seems to be a, a, a pretty broad overreach on the HOA's part. So I'm not sure if they were referring to the HOA. Um, it sound that they they deleted the question on me, so I can't see it now. But um, whether it's true or not that that's what the purchase our purchase contract says, you know, I haven't read that paragraph to be uh, to be certain that it's correct. But I guess the real question is then, 
is there any limitations on who could request an inspection? Do you have to be the homeowner or could it be a potential buyer that's requesting the inspection or um, is somebody else? Okay. Um, I don't know how you can request an inspection on something you don't own. So it would be difficult for me to honor a request for an inspection by a buyer who doesn't yet own the property. Okay. Um, that would be invasion of privacy. Uh, we do have to comply with the Constitution and be invited on the property. So the owner has the, has the say of whether or not it takes place on their property. Right. Okay, perfect. That makes perfect sense. You know, a buyer could possibly request it, but you're absolutely right. The homeowner is the one that's going to grant entry. James, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Just very, very much in agreement. There's going to be a lot of confusion at the gate. We we are asking you know realtors to have owner contact us rather than have realtor contact us, which we expect is going to happen in the beginning. So we're, you know we'll, we'll work with them, but um, we really want this to be something that the property owner is doing, either the seller if they still own it, or the buyer once they own it. We we believe that's their responsibility. We want to work with directly with them, so we don't get into something that's confusing and the wrong. We end up working with the wrong person, so that's that's kind of where we're going with it. That makes perfect sense, and I I agree. I think agents will call because they're curious and they want to understand. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, it really is important that we put the put this responsibility on the homeowner for getting the the right information because they are the one required to be in compliance. So um, with that, we've gone through all of our questions and I want to see if anyone has any final thoughts you'd like to share. I know we're, we're just over time now. I wanna be um, sensitive to your busy schedules, but do any of you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? James, go ahead. I'll throw something else out, because I see this happening. Uh, a seller requests an inspection um, there's something needs to be done to make it compliant. And then they potentially sell it to the buyer and the buyer takes over on that. And, and that's fine. Um, we aren't necessarily expecting, hey, if the seller requests it, then it needs to be them the rest of the way. We, we aren't expecting that. Um, so it could be that the seller makes a request. They get a, a letter saying, hey, here's what you need to make it compliant. And that becomes part of the package of sale. We're, we're all very okay with that. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Great, thank you for that. Kevin or Jennifer, any final thoughts? Uh, when confused, go ahead and call us. We're, we're here to help. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer. <laughs> How about you, Jennifer? Yeah, definitely give us a call or better yet, go to ocfa.org forward slash RSG and take, it, take a look. Um, AB 38 is prominent on the left-hand side. It's a button. You click on it. It'll walk you through the process that we have available. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of our audience for participating with us today. And a very special thank you to our fire marshals, um, Fire Marshal Kevin Bass from Newport Beach and uh, Deputy Fire Marshal Jennifer Bauer from Orange County Fire Authority, as well as um, Fire Marshal James Brown from the Laguna Beach Fire Department. This has been very informative. We thank you for helping keep us safe every single day, but helping to try to clear up this confusion. And we appreciate your partnership and uh, giving us a little grace too um, for all of the questions we will continue to ask. So. Thank you for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure. Thank you guys. Thank you to everyone for being here and uh, we will see you soon.